really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. Thanks for joining me here today. I'm glad you've come back to listen to another episode, or maybe this is the first time that you're tuning in. Just to let you know, I share solo episodes here where I talk about spiritual issues that are popping up in my own life right now, things I'm working on, things I'm learning, resources I'm finding that are helping me grow spiritually. And I've decided to share those things because I assume I'm not alone. I'm not the only person out there working on a day-to-day basis, trying to figure life out and trying to figure out how to be the best person I can possibly be. So here I'll share with you things I'm reading, things that have happened to me in the recent past, things I'm currently looking at, what something I've just learned or an aha moment I've had that finally shifted my mindset about something. And so today, I just want to share something that I read on the internet, on social media, and have a a little bit of a discussion about it. So I don't want to go into too many details here, but the post included an obituary that a son wrote for his father when he died. And this was a brutally honest obituary in which the son described how much pain this father had visited upon his entire family. The father was an alcoholic. He abandoned his children. He was abusive. He was basically a terrible person. He'd been fired from jobs. He had multiple children by different women, and he never took care of any of them. When he was around, apparently, he was not at all a good person. And the son decided when his father died to tell the truth about who his father was and to also write about the fact that he wasn't sorry that his father died, that at least what I drew from what I read is that he felt that the world is maybe a better place now that his father is gone. And this, of course, is in contrast to most obituaries that we might read where sometimes people after they have died are idealized, really. We look for the best features about them. We may keep hidden within us the flaws that we are aware of. We keep the pain hidden many times and often don't tell the whole truth about the people we care about after they die. But in this case, it seems to me as though this son had such a fractured relationship with his father, he didn't care to present his father in any kind of positive light. And what was most important to him is simply to be able to be honest. And perhaps in a way, he hadn't been able to be his entire life. Perhaps he had had to hide his pain and cover it up for much of his life and had not been able to receive validation or support or compassion for the pain he experienced along with his siblings, his mother, and other people apparently in his father's orbit. So I read this this obituary and I have no blame whatsoever for the son who needed to tell his honest story and the story of his pain and his perception of his father. The person who wrote the article mentioned that they had reached out to this the son's sister, the daughter of this father, who validated everything her brother had written in the obituary about their father. I did read that the newspaper regretted publishing the obituary, feeling that it didn't meet up to their usual standards and criteria for obituaries, which it sounds as if they like 
like them to remain positive. So they felt concerned that they had allowed that obituary to be published. But what interested me were all the comments that I read on social media and how many people were grateful to have read this obituary and grateful for this son's honesty about his father. So many people echoed that they too had a troubled relationship with one of their parents, that they were not sorry when that parent died, and that they never felt validated for the feelings they had had about their parent. And reading this obituary was the first time they felt a relief in a sense, or felt the opportunity to begin healing and expressing some of their own pain and their own anger and repressed feelings that they've been carrying all their lives. So I was really fascinated by this. And I felt a multitude of emotions about it. So I've spent some time thinking it over. And thinking back to my days in hospice. And this story really reminded me of one hospice patient that I became very close to during his time on our service. And I wrote his story in the book, Seven Lessons for Living from the Dying. His name was Ralph, and he was what we called a vagabond or a hobo, a man who was homeless, basically. He lived by the railroad tracks in our community and had ridden the rails for much of his life, you know, hopped on trains, traveled around the country um, by hiding out in boxcars on trains and gone from one place to another. And had not had a very stable or productive life at all. And Ralph came onto our hospice service when he developed renal cancer. He had, they told us at the beginning, only a couple of weeks to live because his kidneys were failing and he wasn't a candidate for dialysis. So his nephrologist expected that he would he would probably only live about two weeks. And so our hospice took him on as a charity patient, knowing that we wouldn't be paid for caring for him. And Ralph had been given housing in a low-income apartment building, a tiny little basement apartment. Through It was through a pension plan because apparently he had worked for the railroad at one time and had some sort of old pension fund there that qualified him for some assistance. And that's how he had a place to live and a roof over his head at the time that he was dying. So we made a number of visits to Ralph and I became rather attached to him and very interested in his story. Ralph was a man of few words. He didn't talk much about his past But from what the nurses and the social worker and chaplain and I had all been able to gather, Ralph had been married in the past and had some children, but he was estranged from all of them, estranged from his entire family. There was no one that he stayed in touch with and no one that cared about him. And he indicated that he had had problems with drugs and alcohol in the past and probably some mental illness as well. And that that's why things hadn't gone well in these relationships in his life. And he'd become a loner and basically stayed away from everyone in his life. So as I looked at the obituary, a son wrote about his father It seemed like his father might be a man somewhat like Ralph, though Ralph may have had a little bit more integrity in that he actually chose to just stay away from his family so that he wouldn't do more harm to them. That's kind of the message I got from Ralph, that he thought it was better for everyone if he kept to himself and stayed away. It sounded to me as if the father in the obituary had done a lot of damage whenever he was present and whenever he was around his family, but also his absence had done damage. Now, the perspective I never got to have with Ralph is how do his children look at him and his behavior? And perhaps it would have been similar to the son who wrote the obituary. Perhaps his own children would have seen him in the same light as a destructive influence in their lives. 
But here we were, a hospice staff taking care of this man who supposedly had two weeks to live and had no one who cared about him anywhere in his life. And we were there to usher him through the last days of his life and to help him have the best ending to his life that was possible that that he could have at that time. As the story goes, and it's really, a, it's a fascinating tale, we discovered that Ralph actually had a talent as an artist. And this happened one day when I was visiting Ralph in this little dingy basement apartment that had a mattress on the floor, it had a table, one chair at the table, a sink full of old, gross, dirty dishes, and one reclining chair, which is where Ralph sat. I was visiting him and uh, checking in to see how he was doing, and I noticed these pieces of paper taped to the wall in the apartment, and they were all pieces torn out of a spiral notebook, so they were lined notebook paper, and you could see the raggedy spiral edges where they'd been torn, and they were just put up on the wall with, with some kind of scotch tape or something. When I went closer to look at the pieces of paper just to see what they were, I discovered that they were drawings, drawings done with a number two pencil, again, on spiral notebook paper. But they were pictures of scenes in nature, and they were beautiful. There were mountains, there were deserts, there were trees, flowers, meadows, all kinds of nature pictures. And I asked Ralph where they came from, and he said, I've been drawing them. And I was stunned. Like, you drew these pictures because they were incredibly good. It was amazing. And I said, I didn't know you were an artist. And he said, oh, no, I'm not an artist. I've never drawn anything before. But he said, now that I'm just sitting here waiting to die, I needed something to do. So I found this, I found a pencil and I found this little notebook and I decided I'd draw pictures of things that I've seen in my life when I've been on the railroads. And so it turned out that Ralph had this amazing artistic talent that he had never discovered in his entire life until what we thought was his last two weeks of life. He sat down and tried drawing and it turns out he's amazingly good at it. And this became the topic of conversation at our interdisciplinary team meeting when everyone who'd been visiting Ralph sat down to talk about it. Did you see the drawings? Did you see the drawings he made? They're incredible. And We were amazed to think that this man who seemed to have had such a broken life, seemed to have had such a wretched existence in a way, and and seemed to have brought nothing but, but evil and pain and destruction to others around him, that he had discovered within himself this talent, this amazing ability. And so we decided, we didn't really talk about it or plan it, but it turns out that each one of us had an idea in our heads to bring Ralph some art supplies. And so someone brought him a sketch pad, someone else brought some colored pencils, someone brought some like charcoal pencils for Ralph and we supplied him with some of the things he needed to keep drawing and tools that would actually help him display his art a little bit better and Ralph kept drawing day after day every day he was making something new and they were getting better and better so we were all excited to go visit Ralph to see what he had created next in his little dingy apartment And Ralph kept drawing and drawing and drawing and taping his pictures up on the wall. And we would come and be amazed by his artwork and continue to support him and validate him him doing this art. Because we realized he may be finding some kind of meaning in his life for the first time as he's facing the very end of it. And we were eager to support him. But as we thought about it, he was supposed to have died in two weeks, and here it had been three months, and Ralph was still alive. Ralph was still with us. In fact, 
Ralph was seeming healthier than he ever had before. He wasn't declining or going downhill at all. And it became clear that discovering this artistic talent and being able to release it for the first time in his life was giving Ralph a reason to live, a will to live, and that his body was responding by saying, yeah, I'm going to stick around here longer. And we ordered some lab tests and found out that his kidney function had improved just enough that he was hanging in there. He still had kidney cancer. We still knew that he was going to die of it. It's just that suddenly his prognosis became a little less certain than it had been when he first got admitted to the hospice. So we continued to support Ralph. We were still giving him free care. And basically those of us who took care of him made visits after hours on our way home after we'd seen all the patients that we were being paid to see. We would stop in and check on Ralph. The hospice was providing any supplies that he needed, though he didn't really need very much from us at that time. He was still managing to get by on his own in that apartment. One day I went to visit Ralph and he had a catalog. It was like an old Sears catalog that he had marked open to a certain page and he showed it to me and he said, I'm going to order a desk, a student desk. And he had actually opened opened the catalog to a page where there was a small desk that really would be for a child maybe a 10 or 12 year old child, but a smaller person. He had found this desk that had a slanted top and he wanted the desk so that he could use it to do his drawings on because he'd been doing them on his lap, putting, uh, just holding the sketch pad on his lap. And he was thinking the the desk, the student desk is what he needed. He told me he'd been saving these little pension checks that he got from time to time. And the desk cost $35. He'd been saving up for the previous two or three months and he had enough money to order the desk. So he had placed an order for it to be delivered to him. And once he ordered the desk, something new happened in Ralph in a way too, because he became even more determined that he was going to live because he was waiting every day for the desk to come so that he could do more drawing on his sketch pad on the desk. And Again, he continued with his artwork. He continued to blossom and was trying new things and using colors and different types of media. It was amazing. We were just watching him unfold and blossom before our very eyes as time went on. Though the student desk hadn't arrived yet, it was taking a very long time for the desk to come and we weren't actually sure that it would come, but Ralph was certain that he'd done everything right. He had mailed in this the order form and put money in the envelope and he was sure that the desk would come one day. And what happened with Ralph is that there was a day when A neighbor of Ralph's in the apartment building who used to look in on him from time to time called me one day and said, Ralph isn't doing very well. Would you come and see him? And this was a sudden turnaround because our previous visit with Ralph, everything had been fine. When I went to see Ralph, he was in a lot of pain and was lying on his mattress and unable to get out of bed. And I knew Ralph was, was going downhill rather quickly. I knew that things had really climaxed with his kidney function and that he was in that state of decline that that we had thought he was months earlier when he first got admitted to the hospice. I wanted to do more blood work. He refused it. I wanted to have come, someone come in and stay with him and he refused that. And while I was there visiting him, there was a knock on the door. And when I opened the door, there was a delivery man with Ralph's student desk. It arrived that very day. And so I brought it into him so excited thinking, maybe this is what will help Ralph rally. Maybe this will kind of get him going again. The desk finally came. I brought the box in and I carried it over next to his mattress. And I said, Ralph, it's here. It's here. Your student desk is here. 
and his face was glowing and shining. It's the happiest I've ever seen him be. And he touched the box with his hand and said, my student desk, my student desk came. And I said, yes, it did. And I said, do you want me to unpack it for you? I could help you set it up. I can, I can help you put it together. Do you want me to do that for you? And he said, no, 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 just leave it right there. He said, I just, I want to look at the box for a little while. And I just want to enjoy this for a while. And he said, I need to be alone now. So again, he had refused all the help I had tried to offer him. He didn't want anyone else to come and be with him. So I left, and that was on Saturday afternoon. Sunday morning, I got a call from Ben, the next-door neighbor, who'd gone down to check on Ralph and found that he had died during the night. And the student desk was still in its box still next to Ralph's mattress and Ralph was lying on the mattress facing the box and looking at his his student desk in the box when he died. Now I'm telling you this story because first of all I want you to see Ralph through the eyes with which we saw him. None of us had ever been harmed by Ralph or abused by him or neglected by him, abandoned. We knew him only in the last months of his life. We knew him only as someone who was terminally ill, who was very close to dying. We knew him only as someone looking at his last moments of life. And yet we discovered that he had a talent for drawing. He had a sense of humor. He had a spark of life in him that was amazing and beautiful to behold. And I wonder if anyone who had ever loved him or been connected with him in the past had seen that spark. I wonder what the people who'd been part of his life before knew of Ralph and if they had ever seen anything that we had seen in those last moments of his life. What I wished is that we knew who his family was. I wished he had been able to tell us how to get a hold of his children, how to let them know that he had died, but how to also show them his artwork, how to talk to them about what we had witnessed during Ralph's last days. But we had none of that information. None of the people who had been part of his life before were notified that he died because we had no contact information for anyone. Ralph didn't have any contact information. And so we, who cared for him in the last months of his life, were really, at that point, the only family that Ralph had. We were the only people who were concerned about him. And so we decided to have a little funeral for Ralph. Ralph was cremated by the county um, because they had a pauper's fund for people who had no, no family. And his cremation was paid for by, the, by our county. But no one was there to pick up his ashes except our staff. And we decided to get his ashes and we decided to bury his ashes down by the river because one thing he told us is that he had always loved living near the river and he used to fish sometimes and um, fish for his food and he really enjoyed being by the river and in many places where he had ridden on trains he the trains many times follow rivers and so he'd spent a lot of time near rivers living near rivers camping there and loved being by the river so we decided we would bury his ashes underneath a tree near a river outside our community. And we chose a day and time when we would just do a little makeshift funeral for Ralph and bury his ashes. And I stopped by his apartment building and told Greg, the neighbor who had called on Ralph a few times, I, I told Greg that we were having this funeral just in case Greg would want to know about it. The day of Ralph's funeral came and our staff showed up and brought the ashes thinking it would just be us there. And to our great surprise, there were a dozen people from Ralph's apartment building who were there waiting for Ralph's funeral. 
We didn't know who any of these people were. We'd never met any of them. But it turns out that during the time that Ralph was living in that building, he'd gotten to know many of his neighbors, many more than just Greg. And we were stunned. We didn't know. We had never seen this happening. We hadn't seen anyone except Greg who occasionally called on Ralph. We hadn't seen anyone else. We hadn't heard Ralph even talk about anyone else. But so this dozen people from his building came to his funeral. We buried his ashes and we all stood in a circle around the, the place where we, where we buried them. And one by one, people spoke up and said something about Ralph. Again, we were stunned because here was like a, a teenager who said, I used to stop by Ralph's apartment on my way home from school at night and he would tell me stories and he told me about fishing and he he took me fishing one day and then another another neighbor who who talked about her experience with Ralph and suddenly we realized like Ralph had this little community around him and we didn't even know it Ralph was so quiet and shared so little of who he was. We didn't even know that he was interacting with his neighbors and connecting with them all this time that we were offering him care. So at his funeral is actually when we discovered even more about Ralph, and we found out that these people he had connected with at the very end of his life in his apartment building cared about him. They saw him in a positive light, much the way we did in spite of whatever his history was, whatever had happened in his past. They saw him as as a good person, someone who was kind to them, someone they liked being kind to, and they cared enough to come to his funeral. So I found myself once again reflecting on the father written about in this obituary and wondering where was he when he died? Were there people who knew him only at the very end of his life, who knew things about him that his own family had never seen? Were there people who had watched as he blossomed or grew or found something redeeming within him? that could touch other people, that could help him connect to others before he died. I mean, I don't know that, of course. I never will know that. And I have to admit, as someone wrote in the comments about this obituary, not everyone uh, ends up becoming a better person before they die. I have to admit, I'm sure that's true. But I do have to say, on our hospice service, what I witnessed over and over again with the patients that we cared for, the patients that we gave love to and compassion, I saw amazing things happen. I saw people become their better selves over and over again. I didn't see very many people who died in hatred or anger. I saw many people soften and I saw many people heal in their hearts at the very end of life. And I still believe that it's always possible. And I still believe that we have to hold out hope that every broken soul has the potential for healing. There is no life that is wasted or unredeemable. And even this father, as much destruction as he visited on his family, and again, they have every right to their anger. But even this father has a soul wounded as it must have been, horribly wounded and broken to create such destruction around him in his lifetime. Even that man deserved compassion and care at the end of his life. And I hope, I hope so, so much that he received it. I hope that he had an opportunity to find what is good within him, I hope that it came to the surface for him. I hope that there's something more. I hope that there were other people who might have been able to tell a different part of his story. And so while I 
agree completely. We need to be able to feel all of our feelings. We need to be validated and be able to express our pain. And that's part of this pluralistic wave of spiritual development that we're in. If you go back to my uh, previous episodes, when I talk about the stages of consciousness at this pluralistic level, we're at a place of bringing to the surface our shadow pain and being able to express it and being able to talk about negative, hard, difficult things and put it out into the open. And this is a good place to be. It's very good that we can share with honesty what has actually happened to us and we can validate one another for that pain. But I still believe that we also need to make room for forgiveness. No one has to forgive anyone who's hurt them. But I see the beauty when we are able to have our stories of the past validate our pain, but at the same time, find just enough room to recognize how much those who have hurt us have been hurt themselves, how much pain they are carrying, how badly they were also wounded, and that within all those stories of pain, we're able to find just, just a shred of compassion and find enough room for the beginnings of forgiveness to say, I will let go of the hurt and the pain that you caused me so that I don't continue causing my own hurt and pain. I'm willing to let that go. And I'm willing to recognize that you were also hurting. That's all I'm hoping for in this situation. And I'm not saying I have answers for the children of this man um, who were so badly hurt by him. But I would hope that along the road, somewhere, there is a recognition that Every person is on their own journey here through life. Everyone comes here with things to learn. We all have flaws. We've all been broken and hurt and wounded by the world in so many ways. We've been wounded by the people who should have loved us, the people we thought would love us. And I've always believed that each person tries and does the best they can. Although I understand that sometimes the best a person can do is still terrible, is still not good. But I hope that we can recognize that we still need forgiveness in the world. And it's not weak to forgive people. In fact, forgiveness takes the greatest strength that we have. I hope that as we validate our pain and as we bring it to light, that we still can make a place for forgiveness and see the need for it and see it as something positive that one day we can work toward. And by suggesting this, I'm not in any way diminishing anyone's suffering. I'm simply saying that forgiveness is the act that will bring us closer to love after a situation that has been terribly unloving. Forgiveness is what helps us move forward and move back into a state of growth and bring more love into the world. And so the best way to counteract the hatred and the destruction that has been done to to a person is to help them find a way to move toward forgiveness and greater love ultimately. And so I just needed to put that out there. I expect that there will be people who will absolutely hate it that I said that, who think that forgiveness is weakness, forgiveness is not speaking up, not speaking our truth, not holding people accountable who should be accountable. And I understand that. I understand how people could see it that way. But in honor of Ralph and the lessons that Ralph taught me through his very end of life and what I was able to see 
Ralph bring into the world, I needed to say it. I needed to say that maybe even the worst human being we've ever known has some redeemable characteristics, something that could be loved, that someone could find to love. And maybe we can just hold space for that. I hope so. So thanks for listening to me today and joining me on the podcast. I just wanted to share this story of Ralph, talk a little bit about some of these ideas of mine, and um, I hope you found it interesting as well. So until we come together next week, remember that we are here for love. That's actually the most important thing we can learn in this lifetime is how to bring more love into the world. So face your fear. Be ready for whatever curveballs life throws your way. And just love each and every moment of this very precious life. Bye-bye.